Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Kim Ricketts, and I manage, along with Kirsten Wiley, the Microsoft Research Visiting Speaker Series. Today, we're going to take a tour of the gridlock economy. It's a place where 25 new runways we need to alleviate air travel delays can't be built because of too much ownership, a place where 50 patent owners are blocking a major drug maker from testing a cancer cure, and a place where 90% of the broadcast spectrum is dead air because of too much ownership. How do we get to this place? Well, Michael's going to talk, walk us through that pretty soon. And there is a solution, thank goodness, and Michael is going to walk us through that as well. Um, so please join me in welcoming Michael Heller. He is the Lawrence A. Wein? Wein. Wein, Professor of Real Estate Law at Columbia University Law School. Please join me in welcoming Michael Heller to Microsoft Research. Well, thank you all for being here, and thank you for watching online. So here's the nutshell uh, in a sentence. It's this. Um, if too many people own pieces of one thing, then nobody can use it. That's the whole deal. If too many people own pieces of one thing, nobody can use it. Usually, private property creates wealth. But too much private property has the opposite effect. It creates gridlock. That's a free market paradox I discovered. And it's the core dynamic at, uh, at the center of the gridlock economy. Um, when too many owners control access to a single resource and cooperation breaks down, wealth disappears and everybody loses. In the next uh, half an hour, um, I will give you some concrete examples, uh, some puzzles, uh, the lexicon of gridlock, and some, uh, some fixes. Uh, I am perhaps the most, I, I, I'm, I'm informed uh, this by Henry, our, uh, your, your magical AV guy, that I am the most low-tech speaker you have had. <laughs> So I don't have any PowerPoints, I'm, so I'm sorry. All I have is I, I talk and I, and I write stuff on the board. So I hope that's you know, okay for this audience. Um, so let me start with a life or death example that's happening, uh, happening right now. Uh, this is a story told to me, to me by a drug, drug company executive. Um, he says that he has, he's pretty sure he has, a better Alzheimer's drug. Um, and he can't bring it to market. Uh, the reason is he needs to test it against dozens, uh, he, needs, he needs access to dozens of patents to test his drug for um, safety and efficacy. Um, so you have to imagine this guy uh, walking into a room like this one, except it's filled with biotech patent owners, each of whom has a, a, a patent that's on the, on the critical path for him getting his drug to market. So he has to negotiate successfully with every single person in the room, or his drug doesn't come to market. And what's happened is indeed his, the, this particular drug, the Alzheimer's drug, has been shelved. Uh, and even though it could save countless lives and earn him, uh, he thinks, billions of dollars. Now, this is not an unusual case. I detail in the book a number of, a number of other uh, drug companies that face a similar problem. Uh, drug companies face gridlock every day. How'd that happen? Uh, it used to be in the biotech area. This is a little field for some of you. But in the biotech area, that the basic inputs that you needed for drug discovery were in the public domain uh, before 1980. Uh, so mostly the research was done with federal money and done in universities, and then the, the results were put in the public domain. Starting around 30 years ago, Congress and the courts uh, switched uh, patent law to allow more basic life forms to be patented and to encourage universities to, commercialize, to patent and commercialize their fines. So those changes in Congress and the courts sparked the biotech revolution. And that is a great outcome. Right, they created an entire, extremely valuable, cutting-edge American industry. So in the last 30 years, for example, we now have about 40,000 DNA-related patents that have been issued. Uh, there was an unexpected side effect to these reforms. Uh, and that's where the gridlock economy story comes in. Our um, biotech R&D has been steadily increasing year after year. It's been a fairly steady straight line up. Uh, but New drugs that actually cure disease at the end of that pipeline have been dropping. So what you have is a drug discovery gap. More money going in and fewer products that save 
human life coming out. I've been hearing these stories since I published an article in Science about 10 years ago, noting the possibility of this paradoxical relationship, that is, between more patents and fewer products. But it's not just drugs that are suffering from gridlock. We see gridlock now across, if you look, you see gridlock across the entire innovation frontier. So I want to give you a second, um, a second uh, puzzle um, as to which Kim gave you the punchline. And the question I want to ask is, what is the most underused natural resource in America? The most underused natural resource in America, it turns out, and you guys in this room may know, is the airwaves. Over 90% of the spectrum in America is dead air. It's just dark uh, because of how we have fragmented ownership of, um, of the airwaves. We have thousands of license holders for spectrum uh, who are fragmented geographically and restricted by use and prohibited from transfer. So they own little bits of ownership uh, which are virtually impossible to assemble. So the process of assembling national high-speed wireless networks has been extraordinarily slow and costly in this country compared to the rest of the world. Spectrum uh, goes unused here while Japan and Korea are already um, a generation um, ahead. The US just in the last decade has fallen from number one in global telecom innovation and products from number one out of the top 10 and this year almost out of the top 20. When you travel overseas you can see the future of communications. You see uh, mobile shopping and uh, 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 instantaneous downloads of, for example, television or other multimedia. You, you can't get that here yet. And the losses to the American economy in terms of jobs and innovation uh, uh, measure from, from spectrum gridlock measure in the trillions of dollars. That's the second example. Here's a third example that's a little bit more down to earth. Uh, we all of us waste weeks of our lives stuck in airports. And maybe some of you have wondered, why am I stuck in an airport? Why am I stuck? What's going on? And the answer is real estate gridlock. We deregulated air travel in this country 30 years ago. Uh, so let me ask you, how many new airports have been built in America since 1975? One. Where is it? I don't remember. Denver. The only one. The only airport since 1975 built in America was Denver. Um, air, um, the ATCA, the Air Traffic Controllers Association, says we could end air travel delays in America completely gone with 25 new runways. That's a remarkable datum. We could end them completely. But you cannot build a new runway or a new airport anywhere in America because too many owners, too many owners at the ends of the runways or where the airports might get built block every project. Seattle's an interesting exception in that you're about to get, you may not know this, or maybe you do, you're about to get a new runway at SeaTac um, that has been in process for, does anyone know how long it's been in process for? Do you know, do you know when the need was, the crucial need for a new runway in Seattle was identified? About 25 years ago. And it's supposed to come online in November. So anyway, um, but that's an exception. Uh, and almost nowhere in America do we, do we see new runways in places uh, that um, need them. So just a few more, just a few more um, puzzles I want just, just to throw out there, but I'm not, not going to talk about. Let me ask you a question. Uh, why is it that African American land ownership in this country has dropped 98%, 98% in the last 100 years? Um, why is it that uh, rappers like Chuck D from Public Enemy today rap over um, a single sample? Uh, and they no longer wrap over the, ri the richly um, textured wall of sound that made up uh, early rap. This may, uh, may have been a puzzle to some of you, it was a puzzle to me. Why is it that we can't get clean uh, wind energy from Texas, where it's windy, to Seattle, where you guys are actually willing to pay more for green power, for clean power? And I was just driving in today uh, from, from, um, uh, from Seattle, I passed uh, Indy Mac, which is right around the corner from you guys. Right, you all know this, the big Indy Mac building on 520, which just collapsed um, uh, last week. How is it possible that Indy Mac, which is tiny, could, by comparison with Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, how could they collapse? What, what's the cause of that? And the answer to all of these puzzles is that all of these puzzles are really the same puzzle. Private ownership usually creates wealth, but too much ownership can create gridlock, 
and gridlock blocks innovation. So my goal in mentioning all of these examples is to show you that gridlock is nothing fancy. This free market paradox is all around if you know where to look. There's been, in the last generation, an unnoticed revolution in America in how we create wealth. 10 or 20 years ago, you got a patent and you brought your um, product to market. You got a copyright and you sang your song. You bought raw land and you built housing. That's the old economy. Today, the leading edge of wealth creation requires assembly. Um, drugs, telecom, semiconductors, banking, particularly software, which some of you uh, know about, uh, requires the assembly of innumerable pieces of intellectual uh, property. And it's not just high tech that's changed, although high tech is where a lot of my interest is. It's not just high tech that's changed. Um, today, cutting edge film and music requires the mashing up and remixing of innumerable bits of copyrighted culture. Even with land, the most old fashioned of resources, even with land, the most socially important projects, like new runways, require the assembly of multiple parcels. So what's happened in America, and actually this is not, this is, I, I'm saying in America, but this is true for every um, advanced economy. Uh, this is equally true in, in Europe and Asia. What's happened is that innovation has moved on. But for the most part, we are stuck with old style ownership that is easy to break apart and really hard to put back um, together. So the challenge is that rather than waste time and money dealing with assembly, a lot of the most, world's most powerful companies simply redirect investment towards less challenging areas where they already control the intellectual property, such as extensions of existing products. And by doing that, they let innovation that's possible um, slip away. The flip side to this is that spotting and fixing gridlock is one of the great entrepreneurial opportunities um, of our time. We can reclaim uh, this wealth that we've lost to gridlock, but to do that, um, it takes, it takes um, a lexicon, it takes tools to unlock a grid, um, and that's what I want to do next, is, um, is uh, give you um, the lexicon that you need to spot and then um, to fix uh, gridlock. So ownership congestion, which is what I'm talking about, turns out to be a lot like traffic congestion. Um, the difference is that we're all pretty familiar with traffic jams, uh, but ownership jams are a little harder to see. So individually, right, most, of, most drivers are pretty reasonable people. But if 50 people from four sides of an intersection all want to turn left at once, then everybody gets um, stuck. This is the same with ownership gridlock. Each individual owner is usually acting reasonably, but the sum of their interactions is destroying wealth. When I discovered this dynamic, I called it a tragedy of the anti-commons. Um, and that term has a history, which I want to unpack for you. It's a twist on a term that a lot of you probably studied way back in college or in, uh, in grad school. The familiar concept is the tragedy of the commons. And I want to break that down for those, for the, for those of you for whom that's not familiar. So if you imagine something familiar like the ocean or the air, um, any resource that we share, we tend to overuse and often destroy. We overfish the oceans, we pollute the air. That, wasteful, that, tight, that, that structure of wasteful overuse we call a tragedy of the commons. And the typical solution for tragedy of the commons are two. Historically, one major solution to tragedy was to have the state come in and tell you what to do. Tell you who can fish, how much, for how long, what you can take, state regulation. That's become a somewhat less attractive solution, especially now with, with socialism uh, dead. And the other, the other major solution, the most important solution to solving tragedy is privatization, is creating private owners. Why? Because private owners tend to avoid overuse. If you control the lake, you invest in it. You protect it today so that you get more and bigger fish tomorrow. The secret for private property, the reason, the, the economic reason for private property, more than anything else, is this hidden conservation and wealth creation effect. Until now, the um, guts of ownership, competition, markets, capitalism have been understood through um, through this opposition. 
Uh, on the one hand, uh, we have the commons, uh, which is uh, prone to overuse. And we have the solution, which is to break it up into private property, each person on their little bit, which is um, ordinary use. When we think about the ownership of property, that's what we think about. At one end is the commons, and at the other end, we have um, private, uh, pro pri private property. Um, but that simple opposition uh, mistakes the visible forms of property for the entire spectrum. The entire spectrum is larger. Uh, the danger is that privatization can overshoot. That's the anti-commons. And we can get to the point where we have, instead of overuse, we have underuse. So that was the crucial tool that you need to spot gridlock, is, the, is, is to see the possibility that we can have wasteful underuse caused by too many owners exactly the same way as we can have wasteful overuse caused by too few. Those categories are symmetric. The first is completely familiar. The second is completely hidden. But once you recognize the hidden half of the ownership spectrum, it upends, or should upend, your intuitions about what it means to have private property. It's not the end point of ownership. If private property is the end point, you can never privatize too much. Because all you're doing by privatizing is solving this tragedy of the commons. But if private property is not the endpoint, if it's the midpoint of a continuum, you can go too far. And you can blow right by well-functioning, optimal amount of property rights, well, right by um, private property into uh, anti-commons property. At that point, property destroys wealth instead of creating wealth. Making this type of ownership visible is, uh, is a challenge. It hasn't been easy to figure out how to do it. And that's really the, that's been the challenge of this book, is to figure out ways to frame the anti-commons in a way that makes it visible to people so they can see that it's nothing fancy. So they can see that all of these puzzles that you run into in everyday life are really the same problem. So let me just give you two uh, images that for me have been helpful, and, and maybe they will be for you. Uh, one is robber barons, and the other is big inches. The world's um, original robber barons uh, were German barons on the Rhine a thousand years ago. A thousand years ago, uh, that, the, the Rhine was one, of the, was one of Europe's major trade routes. Um, and it was protected by the Holy Roman Empire. You paid one toll, and you sailed the Rhine from Switzerland all the way to the Atlantic. When the empire weakened, freelance German barons began building toll castles. At one point, they numbered about 200 every, every uh, couple of miles. And the sum of all those tolls made shipping uh, impracticable. Why would you bother going from one end to the other if you were going to have essentially everything taken from you by the toll keepers? So for 500 years, for 500 years, the Rhine continued to flow. It still flows today. But for 500 years, nobody sailed up and down the Rhine. You simply uh, stopped. And that, um, uh, the effect of having too many tolls there was that everybody suffered. Even the barons. Even the barons were worse off. The entire European economic pie shrank during the Middle Ages, in part because of this problem of too many tolls, too little trade. So to understand the gridlock economy today, which is the book, what you just do is update that image. So today's uh, phantom toll booths arise whenever ownership is created. And you guys in the software business know that ownership is being created all the time in ways that you might not immediately recognize as such. So today's robber barons are often public officials who get the regulation wrong at the crucial moment when ownership is being born. But it can also be private companies that you deal with who have the bits and pieces of the technology that you need. Um, or it can be private individuals. So today, the, 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 the equivalent of the crushed trade from the Rhine is today crushed entrepreneurship and crushed uh, ability to innovate. So I, I remember to turn my cell phone off. But your cell phone, um, uh, uh, several thousand patents read on every one of your cell phones. So to get your cell phone into your hands, 
your cell carrier had to overcome the anti-commons. Uh, um, it took them a lot of work, and they didn't get it. They didn't necessarily get it right. So your BlackBerry, for example, was almost shut down by uh, by um, uh, by missing potentially one of those patents. And it's not just the BlackBerry. Um, when I talked to um, um, uh, uh, patent counsel at uh, telecom uh, companies, they say this is a, this is um, the biggest uh, impediment uh, to them introducing new products. It's, it's, it's partly the in, uh, inability to get access to spectrum. But it's, it's, it's substantially the uh, inability to be sure when they bring a new product forward that they aren't going, uh, that they can predict the litigation cost, the follow on litigation cost from the people who come out of the woodwork and sue them for infringement claims on patents they couldn't discover or didn't discover uh, when the product was being, uh, was being put forward. That's an extremely difficult problem for any new type of technology in the telecom industry um, uh, today. Uh, and that's an example, basically, of robber barons blocking telecom um, today. All right, so the answer for why are our cell phones so slow, so pathetic in this country compared to abroad, is gridlock dynamics. It's not thermodynamics that leads to tragedy to the telecommons. There's nothing, yeah, that should be, that's clear. All right, here's, that's, that's one way to think about gridlock. Here's a second way, which is big inches. Um, in the late 1950s, is maybe I'm going to be. There's no one in this room who remembers the Quaker Oats Big Inch giveaway. All right, this is good. You're a young crowd. Um, in the 1950s, uh, Quaker Oats put deeds to square inches of Klondike land in specially marked cereal boxes, and this was the for, for generations in business schools. This was taught as the the most successful marketing campaign in history. M uh, millions of boxes of cereal flew off the shelves. Um, this is my deed. Um, as, and it's also reproduced in the book. Um, uh, uh, so uh, kids love this. But imagine, uh, so there's 20 million of these out there. But imagine if, and, and they're, to, they're to one square inch of land in the Klondike. So imagine if oil is found underneath that square inch. There is no way you could drill ever if you had to negotiate with 20 million kids to get their square inches. And if even one of them can block you, then no drilling happens. So that's a pretty trivial uh, that's a pretty trivial example of gridlock, but when you're, sitting at the, on, when, you're, when you're sitting on the runway or sitting in the airport or circling being delayed, it's the exact same problem. It's big inch gridlock that's keeping, your, keeping these runways from getting built. You have landowners and communities at the end of every runway who are able, uh, on the, under the way we've designed their land use system in this country, to block construction of new runways. So how did I discover gridlock? It wasn't selling the Rhine, and it wasn't uh, Julian the Klondike, I, I first found um, out about, um, first saw gridlock in Moscow uh, when I was there for the World Bank in the early 90s. I was there as the first team into Russia when the Soviet Union uh, fell, uh, uh, collapsed in 1990. They invited the World Bank in to basically create uh, markets, private, private property, land and housing. I was the guy in charge of um, uh, 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 creating uh, private property and land uh, and housing. Uh, but that was part of the bigger transition. And I stood uh, in front of the um, Moscow Supreme Soviet and said, you know, here's, here's some things I'm thinking about doing. Uh, it turns out that it's a lot harder to create uh, private property and markets than it is to destroy it. Um, anyway, um, at one point, uh, Gaidar, uh, Igor, Igor uh, Gaidar, who was the um, uh, deputy prime minister in charge of transition, um, asked, um, gave, asked, me a, asked a question, uh, which is this, um, which, was a, which was a real puzzle. He had privatized storefronts a year earlier, uh, but the stores were completely empty. And on the streets in front of the stores, on the sidewalks, there were these little flimsy metal kiosks. This is a very cold place. So these kiosk merchants and the shoppers were standing in the cold directly across the sidewalk from completely empty, heated, lighted, secure storefronts. And the question is, the question Guider asked me was, why don't these Merchants come in from the cold. Don't they know better? And I, so I stood there with my forehead uh, stuck against one of these windows, trying to think of something halfway smart to say back to this guy uh, in a couple days I had to figure it out. And what I discovered was that it was really easy to set up a kiosk. You just um, bribe a few officials, you choose your mafia gang that's going to protect you, and you open your kiosk. By contrast, setting up a store was a lot more difficult. The way Russia had privatized storefronts 
was instead of saying, you know, you get store A and you get store B and you get store C, they said, you get the right to sell the store and you get the right to lease the store and you get the right to occupy the same store. The same store. Which meant that all these guys had to agree with each other for anyone to do anything. And the result was that uh, stores stayed empty. Russia went very quickly from having too few owners to having too many owners. And that, those empty storefronts were my first literal glimpse into a tragedy of the anti-commons. Or in plain English, too many cooks spoil the broth. So this is a very simple idea. But it has a lot of explanatory power. Moscow storefronts are far away, but missing drugs, slow telecoms, sitting on the runway, a near infinity of problems are the same problem. After I discovered this half of the ownership spectrum, uh, James Buchanan, who some of you work you know, uh, he's no, the, 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 the economics noblest who uh, helped uh, create a public choice theory. Anyway, he, um, he uh, said, yeah, this is right. And he, wrote, he, he published a paper uh, modeling uh, the anti-commons uh, um, and basically showing that uh, my intuition that this half of the owner's spectrum was, existed uh, was, uh, was right and was symmetric to uh, the problems of the uh, commons. Uh, since, uh, since then, uh, later, last uh, two years ago, some uh, business school researchers um, discovered that when uh, business people negotiate dilemmas uh, between, among themselves, when the dilemma is posed to them, when it's framed for them, um, in any commons terms, people are able to block each other. Uh, the people who are negotiating do a worse job, they get worse outcomes, uh, than if the identical dilemma is posed for them, is framed for them in commons terms. Which is interesting. So mathematically, these are symmetric. But in practice, people have a harder time working themselves out of an ownership structure that leads to underuse, because it's invisible, I think, than overuse which is much more visible. It's easy to see pollution. It's hard to know where you go to protest for the products that Microsoft has wanted to create but hasn't been able to because the IP situation is too fragmented. Um, uh, the word underuse isn't in most dictionaries. That's amazing to me. Until th uh, three years ago, underuse wasn't a legitimate Scrabble word. Isn't that incredible? Wasn't a legitimate Scrabble word. Anyway, now it is. But it wasn't until, when I started writing the book, it still wasn't. And my uh, fact checker said, actually, now it is. And I, so I, I learned something. Anyway, this is an idea that turns out to be, I hope, uh, useful uh, equally in the left and the right. So, and then that, so far, that's been the reception that the, that the book has had. Um, conservatives uh, say this, is, this book is a story about the cost of misregulation. And liberals say this is a story about the cost of excessive privatization. And those are flip sides of the same story. But no matter, no matter where it is that you stand politically, or on what side of the um, academic business divide you're on, uh, this game, lo gridlock, is a losing game for all the players. So let me just wrap, I mean, time is short, so I'm going to stay, stay at 30 minutes. Let me just wrap up. Uh, um, in the book, I take, I take you, and I hope you all leave with the book, I take you on a tour um, of gridlock, of the key gr gridlock battlegrounds that I've seen. So I, I, I talk about rappers, and there's FCC officials. I have a, I have a long um, pirate tale. So if you guys are into pirate tales, there's a pirate tale in the book. Um, there's a bunch of ways to um, uh, spot gridlock and a bunch of ways to fix it. Let me just mention the key ways to fix it. First is entrepreneurship. Um, you can get rich by getting good at assembling property. So people get rich by assembling patent pools. The reason your um, DVDs and JPEGs work in any player is that the patent owners voluntarily assemble those patents so that instead of each of them earning nothing, all of them could earn something. It's the same with copyright collectives, which is why you can hear music on the radio. Um, legislation. Second path to fixing gridlock is legislative and advocacy on your guys' part. Um, so for example, in the book, I show uh, right now it's really hard to assemble land in this country. You either secretly buy it up, which doesn't usually work, or what you do if you're a developer is you have the government condemn the land for you, which people hate. It drives people nuts when governments use eminent domain. Um, so those are only two options. Uh, and in the book, well, once you realize what the problem is, the problem is gridlock, you, begin, you can begin to see, well, hey, we can have analogies to things like patent pools or in this case, analogies to condominiums for assembling land. So I propose in the book um, something called Land Assembly Districts, LADS. You have to have a cool acronym like LADS to sell it. So I propose LADS as a way to let neighbors uh, decide for themselves uh, if they want uh, to sell. Similarly, with patent gridlock, the most heavily lobbied bill in Congress this year, the bill that you know, a handful of you heard of and most of you didn't, 
was a bill to fix patent gridlock. It was a bipartisan effort, and it just died uh, because um, basically high tech America couldn't uh, strike a deal with, uh, the, uh, with big pharma. Um, so uh, even though it wasn't, it wasn't a, le a left-right divide, it was a high-tech America coalition divide um, that killed it. There has to be room there to strike a deal. That is, we have to, there, there, there is a way, I'm pretty confident, to design a law that protects drug makers' ability to earn a profit and has them get out of the way of the rest of us who need reforms in order to be able to fairly and efficiently assemble property rights for uh, valuable new products, including the drugs that might save our lives. The third path is philanthropic. And here um, I talk in the book about um, one of the, I think, the best examples of overcoming gridlock, which is um, uh, the malaria vaccine work that the um, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation um, has done. So it's not, I'm not talking about that to you just because I'm here, but it's actually, I think, that really a fabulous way, probably this, uh, method for how you cure gridlock. What they did is they went and uh, they, they discovered that part of it was blocking vaccine research for malaria, which is one of the world's worst killers is that there were dozens and dozens of, ex, of uh, patents uh, that you needed in order to just do the first couple of uh, steps along the path to vaccine development. And they bought them up and made them available widely so researchers don't run into this patent thicket when they, on, on the first stage, of, um, on the first stage of, um, of, of research. So that's the philanthropic solution. But the most important, the single most important key, I think, to fixing gridlock is to see it, is to make it visible and give it a name, um, then we can see what the links are among these puzzles. We can leverage from one area to another. People can work together in coalitions when you realize that you're facing the same problem as other industries you may not realize you're facing the same problem. There's nothing, in, there's nothing at all that's inevitable about gridlock. Right? It's not thermodynamics. It's decisions that we make about how to um, control uh, the resources that we value, um, we value the most. Uh, uh, this, um, uh, so the book was released yesterday, <laughs> and there was just a review on Slate, uh, uh, I guess m uh, Monday, uh, on Slate.com um, by uh, Tim Wu. Probably most of you know his name. Anyway, he wrote, it was Move Over Marx was the name of it, he was reviewing the book. Um, and he, he uh, talks about what he calls the compendium of counterintuition. So books like um, Gladwell's books and Surowiecki's and Chris Anderson's Long Tail. And he says, you know, this is part of that compendium of counterintuition. And I, I like that framing um, because the idea of this book is to give you easy access to uh, one big, new, simple, useful idea about how to innovate uh, t today. So that's what the book is aimed for, is people who are interested in innovating, People who are interested in seeing the hidden workings of everyday life, or if you're just interested in assembling resources for some kind of positive change, um, this is the book for you. What's most exciting about being here at Microsoft, for me, is that more than anyone, you guys are at the cutting edge of these problems in the economy. So you probably, and I, I'm going to stop in one minute, you have dealt with this problem more than I have. And you have probably come up with solutions more than I have. So I look forward to hearing that from you. Thanks a lot. And the floor is open. I don't know how, how does this work? Uh, right here in front. The, um, I have no doubt that the lack of new runways is a result of the uh, anti comments. However, the air traffic delays aren't caused by that. They're actually caused by the tragedy of the commons. Any oh, I like that. Good. Open his airplane and key up the mic and, and request taxi. There's no. There's nothing that says there's only five slots today, and there's no regulation about that whatsoever. In fact, we pilots like it that way. Uh, of course, you do. Small pilots get there, and, you, and, and one of the interesting things about small pilots is uh, when big jets take off, you can space them fairly closely because they can blast through the wake from the jet in front of them. But small pilots get to have a longer lead time between planes. So you get a small plane on the runway, you, take, you slow down the entire airport, because it's a small plane, and one guy takes off. Which points to a tragedy of the commons, and it points to a second problem. Um, one of my favorite headlines when I was reading this, this book was, was a headline that says, um, gridlock in the search for air travel delay gr um, gridlock solutions. Um, and, the, and, the, and the problem is that these are multiple forms of mispricing 
of airplane takeoff slots. So you can, so there's lots of different margins along which you could operate. You could um, charge this, the little pilot guys a lot of money. You could charge them a lot more. You're charging the scarcity cost of the space that they're taking up, which we don't do. That would have a lot, that would free up a lot more space. Well, what, what in fact happens is that SeaTac charges and the other airports don't, and so we don't use SeaTac. We use Boeing Field, and Boeing Field is actually segregated in the airspace. So uh, it, it sort of sorts itself out. What doesn't sort itself out, though, is airlines creating additional flights. And they don't right. have any permission to do that. They right. just do it. Right. So the, 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 um, and this is going to be true. I mean, to, to him that you press me in all these examples, there are any other ones in the book, um, uh, there, are there are multiple sources of anti-commons gridlock, and there are multiple sources of each of these problems. So um, we could have more congestion pricing. We, uh, uh, um, air uh, paths in this country are very heavily restricted. We could, we're in the process of moving towards freeing people up from having single uh, pathways so they can fly, um, they can find their, own, uh, uh, find their own pathway and not bump into each other. So there's, there's, there's a lot of different reasons why we have air travel um, gridlock. Uh, new runways will go a long way. At key airports, we'll go a long way towards fixing it. Um, but like when you build a new lane on the highway, you have to be thinking about other ways to limit people from simply filling that up as well. So absolutely, it's not the, it's not the, only, it's not the only problem, it's not the only solution. Congestion pricing for takeoff slots is a, is a good idea. Yeah? Have you uh, either looked at or applied this to, say, large corporations? You know, you reach a certain <coughs> size, it becomes too much micro-ownership. Internally. Simple. Internally, and that causes a kind of paralysis or gridlock. Oh, that's interesting. Can you, do you have an, do you have an example? Microsoft excluded. Microsoft. <laughs> no, but it's just, the problem of assembling knowledge within a corporation is one of the you know standard, interesting problems that that that'll be yeah right. They have to sort of distribute ownership and get siloed, and then become victims of their own. That's interesting. I haven't thought about it um, internally within a corporation, but of course. That has to be right, and it's, it's certainly true. It's certainly true in, within the uh, regulatory on the public side. Um, uh, one of the uh, pieces of the subprime story um, is that you, we designed a set of financial instruments uh, that were intended to take advantage of the existing regulatory scheme, which is a scheme that fragmented decision-making control mm -hmm. among multiple regulators, no one of whom had the ability to say, you know, no, this is crazy. Um, they each had a piece, but no one had the big picture. Um, and that's that. I mean, of course, it's going to be true within a corporation as well. And it's the same thing that Homeland Security was, was, was intending to address. I mean, both, you know, the same way we've got to have the SEC and we have to have the feds and we have yeah. uh, to, to, to remedy the problem. It's, it's a similar problem. So there's your next book. No, my next book is, is, is exactly that. Is, 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 is the next book is, is focusing um, harder on this question about um, how do we take away the impediments to innovation in high tech America? I mean, this, that's what this book is about, but really focusing much more concretely um, industry. One of the things we don't have now is good um, industry specific data on what really are the costs um, of the patent system to innovation. On balance, are we doing better or worse? So yeah, I absolutely, I think that's, I think that's an incredibly interesting area. Yeah. From what I understand, yeah. it, the problem was innovation in a very bad way because you created new types of, of instruments. And, and <coughs> you know, a, lot, a lot of the financial instruments that are, that are falling apart right now were designed specifically with the um, uh, stupidly uh, organized, fragmented regulatory system in mind. They were designed specifically to avoid regulation by, those, um, by, uh, by any particular one of those regulators. And you can do that by carefully structuring um, your bond instruments. So yeah, so, so it's all, it all interacts. Um, but uh, IndyMac is it's a, it's a great gridlock story, I think. Um, yeah. The tragedy of the commons is, is overuse, right? right. So um, but my sense is that uh, it doesn't really apply to intellectual property, right? I mean, sort of intrinsically it doesn't apply to intellectual property. You don't have... If, I, if I have an idea, how can you overuse it? Exactly. Right. And so I guess what I'm wondering is, on this spectrum then, yeah. if you were thinking about um, the best sort of you know, place to be at on the spectrum for intellectual property, mm -hmm. you know, where, where I'm saying best in sort of a, a socialist sense, perhaps greatest with the greatest number or something. The utilitarian sense. necessarily right. on this end and not on that end? Um, there, there, there isn't going to be a single answer. answer. Part of the brief of the book is to just alert you to, the, the, to, to, to asking that question. Right? Just to say, okay, we have to think about how we design these structures with 
these two, uh, these two extremes in mind. It, it isn't just the case that having more patents is going to create uh, more wealth. It, it might be, but we also... Uh, not necessarily, because you know, when you think about the toll, the robber barons on the Rhine, they actually, uh, everyone lost out. And, and that seems to be the case from the patent system as a whole right now, that the costs of litigation generated by the patent system exceed um, the entire uh, benefit, uh, uh, economic benefit to the corporations that own those patents as a whole in the country, which is really a remarkable figure. I think, it's on the, I think we think patents as a whole are generating you know, several billion dollars in net value to the corporations that hold, individuals that hold them, and litigation per year is on the order of uh, 10 or 12 billion. It's really a, quite a, so, the, so um, yeah, so for ideas, you know, um, this, this is, um, for, for, for um, innovation and ideas, once you have the idea, the best price for the idea is zero. Because if I have the idea, then you, know, doesn't, and you use the idea. We want everyone to use the ideas. We want to price it at zero. But if the price is zero, why should I go to the trouble of having ideas? So the intellectual property system in general is more than other areas of property. It's understood as an area where what Congress constitutionally is instructed to do. Right? Copyright and patent are in the Constitution commanding Congress to create this system to promote innovation, um, promote progress, um, uh, is to find the right balance. That is, giving enough protection to spur the optimal level of innovation, but not one iota more, because then you're simply creating a monopoly with no redeeming, with no countervailing social value. So the goal of how much should there be in the system is to um, minimize the costs of overuse and minimize the costs of underuse. Now, how do you say that? How do you do that programmatically? That's hard to do in any area. But the goal, my goal, is to make you ask those questions. So if, if you're asking that question, I feel like I've already done my job. That's good. All right, floor is open. Yeah. Are you familiar with uh, the work in white spaces that Microsoft and other companies are doing with the FCC to overcome the telecom? Um, um, I, I can explain that. You, why don't you explain it? Because you probably know more about it than I do. So it's not part of it that I could explain yeah. uh, without losing my job. Uh, <laughs> Always the risk. The, the, the notion, essentially, notionally, it's that you can sense whether a particular uh, spectrum resource is in present use or not, right. and use it at lower power or in some other constrained way, right. getting out of the way of the actual, quote, owner or primary user, if that primary user decides to then step up and start using it. This is, this is one of the workarounds. Telecom is complicated. This is one of the workarounds of a really stupid licensing system that we have. Is, so you have second and third order solutions to bad primary property rights design. Um, Spectrum, well, let me, this is, this is always a danger when you start, start talking about Spectrum. It's even more of a danger when you talk in front of a Spectrum audience, but you guys can't correct me. It's just evolved. It changes through time. No one can perceive these changes or what the, you know, what's going to change. All right, so. Um, let me give you a couple different points. Okay, so, so if, you, if you look at spectrum, you have, you have frequencies in prime spectrum from 300 megahertz to 3 gigahertz. Um, you have a little band that's really heavily used. You have the cell phone band. You have the PCS band. Um, but most, like I said at the start of the talk, most spectrum is just extremely little is being used. So that's one dimension of use. But spectrum can be talked about in the well, way as engineers talk about it, in at least seven different dimensions. This is one dimension, is the amplitude of the signal. Um, but another dimension, so for example, I might have the right to broadcast at a certain at 900 point something megahertz. Um, so here's my little cell phone receiver, uh, and there's a satellite up here, and I'm, I'm broadcasting. So that satellite owner has the right to control that, that frequency. Um, but they control it nationally, but another satellite that came from that was uh, that was in a different part of the sky that broadcast from a different direction would be completely not interfering with the first one. Because, for example, for Direct TV, you point your you point your satellite in one direction uh, towards a certain part of the sky. A competing service could easily have a satellite in a different area, and you could point a different satellite, a different dish, in a different direction. So you could actually take the same spectrum and use it again if you had a smarter way to regulate it. That, is, that, allowed, a geo, um, that allowed directional um, as well as uh, amplitude ownership. And the white spaces, um, the white spaces um, initiative 
um, leverages another dimension of spectrum. I'm, I feel like I'm going off too far into spectrum. Do you, does, is this interesting? All right. Um, um, another dimension of spectrum. Um, I don't usually use this much Blackboard. This is a, all right. Another dimension of spectrum um, is uh, you, might have some, you might have some signal. And below, below a certain amplitude, um, it's basically uh, this is one piece of this, different versions. It's just noise. So the signal is up here. Certain, um, one of the initiatives that we have is to, um, as for people who, are, who can broadcast in what's now considered noise um, without interfering with the part that's considered signal. Because right now you can't broadcast at all if it's somebody else's um, licensed spectrum. White noise, the white noise is, is saying when the people who are broadcasting are silent, your smart radio will switch over to that band and use it. And as soon, well, as one version of this, as soon as they start using it again, it immediately switches over to a different one. So it's basically using the dead, the, it's basically using the unused time, which turns out to be most of the time for a lot of spectrum. So there are multiple ways, there are many dimensions along which we could multiply the amount of prime spectrum that we have. And right now, we don't really do any of those, which is remarkably stupid and costly for our economy. So Microsoft and a few other corporations are involved in trying to figure out ways to persuade the FCC to experiment with some of these um, other dimensional uses of what's now dead spectrum. And technologically, it's a little bit it's a complicated project to do in, some of the early tests haven't gone so well, but you know, it's, it's, it, there's no reason why it won't work or will work. It's just a matter of figuring it out and a matter of persuading the FCC uh, to uh, you know, stop being stupid on this point. Yeah? Before I came to Microsoft, I spent a lot of time working on uh, the orphan works problem in copyright, which is, I would okay. assume you mm -hmm. would say, is part of a, part right. of a mm -hmm. gridlock problem, right. which is transactions don't occur because people don't have accurate information or any information about who owns what right. parts of a copyrighted work or an, or an It is copyright. remarkable in this country that you literally cannot find out who owns a copyright. You can't find it out. Go on. The major opponent to, uh, and most participants in the copyright space think something should be done on that in terms of legislation, but the primary opponents who have been successful in installing any legislation are individual copyright owners like photographers and illustrators and freelance mm -hmm. authors. Who would say to your claim that the holdup problem, mm -hmm. the, the last, copy, last property owner who stops right. the transaction, they would say that's not a bug, that's a feature. That is something that actually is their defense against infringers, others who would claim a holdup problem but really right. are just abusers of the system. Right. And that that sort of private property ownership, if you ignore that, you become unmoored for what kind of standards you use for allocating no, the resources. Listen, you know, this so how do you, I mean, the question, I think the larger question from what you're proposing is, how do you deal with that, those minority rights and, right. and the, those individuals who, who, who get very worried that um, in the name of a more utilitarian solution, mm -hmm. you're actually carving back on a very important driver of I know, I, I absolutely recognize that uh, You know, this guy thinks that that's the most important copyright in the world. But just because this person thinks it's the most important doesn't mean that it's good social policy. And it's a matter of choice and persuasion whether we go with, you know, this or this. So, yeah. The people who own, this is the same as true in the biotech area, in the pharma area, right? Every, every little biotech um, uh, company says, we've got the key brain receptor patented. Ours is the key. The other one's not so important, but ours is the key. And anything that weakens our ability to sue for triple damages in an injunction for infringement of our little patent is destroying our private rights. And, 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 and that is exactly what Congress's job is, is to mediate those choices between competing resource users. And if they decide that the part of my goal is to make clear -er to people who decide that you know, there may be a lot of these guys making who are loud, but the sum of the value that is being created by these little orphan owners is negligible. And the cost of not being able to find them is significant. 
And if that's the case, and if our patent and copyright system is predicated on the notion of, of creating progress and value, then you change the law. Or, that's one, or you make it easier for these little guys to get together. Or you create some mechanism that makes it easier for these private individuals to overcome the transaction costs and holdups that you're now seeing. Can I just follow up? Yeah. There's two different points you made there. Yeah. The first one you basically say, because I've heard this from the illustrators and everything, when yeah. you say to them, the value of what they own is negligible. Right. I suppose as a political matter, and I think as, as, a, as a process of mediation, right. you, 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 not only, you not only insult them, you, you, also, you, you, you also give the other side that they're opposed to arguments. You know, you, you're, you're prejudging what the value is. Okay. The second question with respect to transaction costs right. to me is a much more sort of policy neutral sort of mediated okay. response, which doesn't, you don't have to, you don't have to decide what the value, who knows what the value is. Some of that stuff may be actually very valuable. We, that's part of the problem. No one really knows the value. Right. No, so this is, so but so the, I think, so if you focus on a transaction costs element with collecting societies or other things, right. to me is, is a, no, I, a right. That's true. I mean, like I, like I said, you know, there's, there's different kinds of solutions. There's legislative choices to make, and there's also ways to make it easier for people to, on their own, assemble these things. Absolutely. Um, before we had ASCAP and BMI, you know, it was really complicated to put stuff on the radio because you potentially had to license every single play of every single song. In a sense, every single song was an orphan work. So what ASCAP and BMI do, is these are copyright collectives that um, mean that everybody gets paid something uh, and, uh, you know, and some small number of people who would have gotten paid more, get, get, they, some small number lose out. But as a whole, you can turn the radio on and listen to music, which you could not do. You know, I, uh, I don't, you, you can't get China Beach on DVD or WKRP in Cincinnati, the old TV shows. They're just gone because um, ASCAP covers radio play, but it doesn't cover licensing for multimedia DVDs. So we have no way to... Uh, put those licenses together in the um, DVD context. It's really something. You know, a lot of our culture just disappears because of that. The best documentary on Martin Luther King is Eyes on the Prize. It was made in the 80, 87. Um, and it's the main way that most people know who Dr. Martin Luther King is. is you know, millions of people s learned about him th through his documentary, which sat in the vault for 20 years because the documentary was put together from 120 archives of video and hundreds of photos and uh, it was all licensed for a single air use. And then since then, it, then for 20 years, it was impossible to assemble those licenses again. So um, there are proposals out there for the orphan works, for example, to have uh, you pay a dollar. And if you pay a dollar, your work is registered for some period of time. So if, it, if it's worth more than a more than dollar to you, um, you can protect your work. But still, 99% a potential orphan works person wouldn't even bother paying a dollar, and all of that would fall into the public domain. So a solution like that maybe is politically more feasible. We can say, if it's worth a buck to you, here's a simple way to protect it. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. How are we doing? We're still good. Okay, we still have a little more time. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I was just wondering to follow up what he was saying. How much of, of the gridlock is caused? I mean, part of it is, as you say, is distributed ownership, but in the case of patents, we don't know what's owned. I mean, and I think that, that, that the application of a patent could be you know, very, very small. It could be infinitesimal. Right. And I think that it's that uncertainty that is causing... No, right. So um, have you guys had Mark Lemley up here or Carl Shapiro, these guys? I mean, they've written... These are um, lawyer and economists at Stanford and, and Berkeley who've written a lot about the um, economic costs from uncertainty in patents. And patent, what they call... Um, they call patents probabilistic property rights. Um, so it's... You know, with, with a piece of land, you pretty, you, there's a lot of uncertainty. But, but, you more or less, but you more or less can define a lot of the characteristics of land. But for a patent, it, um, its validity is at best probabilistic. And its scope is probabilistic. And um, what can, whether you're infringing is hard to... Almost none of these pieces can be sorted out in advance. So even knowing which patents to license, even if you're as diligent as possible, is impossible. And many patents aren't issued, but you may still potentially be infringing. Yeah, really? It's quantum, and, and it's quantum and it's costly because you, you don't get, you know, the legal system doesn't give you the break. It gives the eventual patent owner the, the, all the presumptions. Um, they, all, they all cut against the subsequent innovator. So it is a major flaw in our patent system, the struct, uh, a system that allows very weak patents to be issued uh, with very ambiguous scope 
to be secret for a long time and with draconian penalties for people who infringe some things that they potentially couldn't even discover. So you really don't buy patents for insurance. Uh, or you buy, or, or another way of viewing it is as, as, as extortion. A lot of the, um, a lot of the, um, a lot, well, a lot of, yeah, no, a lot of the counsel at big, at, um, you know, at, at, uh, you know, the, the big, uh, you know, the American Expresses and Microsofts and, um, uh, you know, Sprints and Verizons, a lot of what they're, a lot of what they're doing is spending, they're doing is spending millions, hundreds of millions of dollars uh, buying either por- individual patents or portfolios of patents that they view as junk. But their patent counsel says, there's 100 patents here. I can win 95 of these, but I don't, I don't know if I can win every one of them. And pay the guy $100 million and have him go away. That is not productive use of scarce company resources, but it is the routine for high-tech innovators. How are we doing? One more, we sh- one more question. Or they may have the last, anybody else? Yeah, last question. I just wanted to support some of your fixes. Uh, we Good. Have a couple of fresh examples. I work for Microsoft Game Studios. And, uh, Great. Uh, we are seeing some of that evolution that you're describing for radio and, and music occur uh, on the interactive entertainment side. Meaning that, you know, for, for a game, we need to sign close to, used to, we have to sign close to like three, 4,000 contracts. For a game, you have to sign three or four thousand contracts yeah, in order to issue a game out. Um, okay. But now, especially for the broadening titles like Rock Band, Lips, okay. Guitar Hero, we're seeing those games outsell records and radio shows and concerts. Okay. So the artists and the patent holders they come to us, and um, they're consolidating uh, willingly. So you see the the anti commons mm-hmm. era go back to the. So you're seeing voluntary assembly. Yes. Um, in order to have, in order to having the sum of zero, you know, 100 times zero is still zero. Right. So these people are coming to us, and now we see Metallica launch their new album on rock band together with. Um, I love this. DVDs. See, I love these stories. I love it. Or uh, Aerosmith is making mm-hmm. more money from a video game deal uh-huh. than any. Than from performing. I love it. I love it. That's great. That's 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 the solution. I love it. Thank you guys so much. <laughs>